Amen. Please be seated. Is that your prayer this morning? For the follow of Jesus? Amen. No matter what. Ah, good to be here today in the house of the Lord. We have got some good stuff in store for you. Uh, we're going to learn about marriage. And today we're going to talk about what I think is probably, uh, this is kind of a bold statement, but like the number one problem in marriage and primarily a lot of the relationships that we have. And so uh, we're excited that you're visiting with us here as a guest. And if you have the opportunity to uh, just give us a little information about yourself so we can follow up, there's a little connection card inside your uh, note-taking guide there, inside your bulletin. Uh, if you want to just grab all that stuff out, I know we put a bunch of stuff in there today. Um, and we want you to follow along in this message today because I believe uh, from what I've seen, what I've learned uh, in my marriage and what I see in Scripture, uh, this could change your life forever. Uh, <laughs> it always comes down to obedience, though, that we would have to actually do what we learned today. But uh, this number one problem in marriage, are you ready for it? Uh, I'm going to say it is resentment. Things build up, and uh, you notice how couples fight about really stupid things sometimes? And I was even telling the guys group, I said, I want you guys to start watching all the marriages in the church and just watch them and see. You will notice that people fight, that they nitpick back and forth. Uh, and sometimes it's really subtle and you can't see it. Uh, when Dale and I would do worship team together, everybody saw it up here. Um, but uh, uh, you can watch and you'll see this happen. Um, and what happens is we basically forget First Corinthians 13.5, which basically says, love doesn't keep record of wrong. Now, we start making a list. I remember, I know what you did, all of these things, and they start to build. And uh, I think it all comes down to this wanting to say, I'm not always wrong. Right? In fact, I like to be right. And when you point it out to me that I'm not right, it goes on my list. Right? And I remember it. And then I, I find a little way to get it back in some other way to say, you know what? You've got some issues too. And this resentment builds. And, and, and the Bible just has this amazing way of describing this. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 15. Look at this on the screen. It says, See to it that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble, and by it many become defiled. See that picture? How many of you have weeds growing in your garden or in your lawn? Yeah. So we don't water our Bermuda grass all winter. So it's dead, right? Guess what? It's beautiful green in my yard. Weeds! I didn't water them. I didn't fertilize them. I didn't do any. I've had them mow for like three weeks in a row. Because they just have a way of growing up, don't they? And resentment turns into bitterness, and it does the same thing in our lives. And if we're not careful, it will take over. And I think what happens is, uh, I, one of my favorite books, I actually reordered it, it's got this great title. It says, Hurt People Hurt People. Right? When you get hurt, you want to hurt somebody back. Right? And, and some of the most hurtful people in your life are people that have been hurt in some deep ways. And many times that's why we hurt each other. But what happens is, is those things begin to pile up and we can't find a way to get rid of them and they begin to destroy relationships. Uh, there's a guy named John Gottman who is like the godfather of marriage relationships. Like he has done scientific experiments, almost like lab rats, where he's put people in a room and videotaped them like 24 hours a day and noticed how they interact with each other. And so he's done all these studies on relationships. They can predict with just a few interview questions and some observations of some couples, they can predict within 80 to 90 percent percent accuracy of who's going to get divorced. Just because of the things they've learned. He named four things. He calls them the four horsemen of the apocalypse. In marriage. That's his name for them. And we'll put them up here. The first one is criticism. Uh, when criticism comes in, it begins to destroy relationships. 
And, and this comes very easily. We, somebody hurts us, and so we criticize them, or we see things that we don't like. And sometimes just because of the differences between men and women in marriage and in relationships, we're different than other people. And so we criticize what we don't like. You injured me, and I'm going to let you know. And what happens on the other side? And we're defensive. Not me. Couldn't have been me. Must have been you. Right? Uh, it can't be my problem. And so defensiveness starts to go up. And that's where that back and forth goes. Well, you did this. Well, you did that. Well, you did this. Well, you did that. And it grows into resentment and bitterness. And so criticism, defensiveness, and often the next step is contempt. Well, you begin to really harbor some bad feelings towards that person, and it spills out in words that you may have never guessed you would say to that person. And you start injuring them, and, and it gets more personal. And this is where those words they tell you to never say, but you say them. You always do this. You never help me. You always do that. And all these extremes, because we're attacking. That contempt grows, and eventually something he calls stonewalling takes place. You get the picture? It's a stone wall. You're not coming in here. And you put up the wall and you say, don't touch me. Don't, don't go there. And, and, and one of two things happen. Either at this point, people begin to separate. That's where divorce happens. That's where relationships break up. And they're like, fine, I'm not going down that road anymore with you. And you put up the walls and you're done. The other thing that often happens, I think especially in Christian marriages and relationships, is you settle. You just learn to not talk about that. And you just go around those issues, and, and we just we know that they're going to get mad, and so we just don't even talk about it, and we just end up living these two separate lives. And some married people are the most lonely people on the planet, even though they live in the same house as somebody. So single people... We're going to learn about this next week. Singleness is not that bad. All right? There's some great things about singleness. But marriage is also beautiful when you do it God's way. So, uh, four things. Criticism, defensiveness, contempt, and stonewalling. When we start heading down these roads, it can destroy our relationships. And I think as we begin this morning, one of the questions we have to really ask about those relationships that we're thinking about right now, do I really want them to get better? Do I really want a better relationship with so-and-so? Or do I kind of like the fact that I don't have to deal with them? Do I kind of like the fact that uh, I can blame them for everything that's going on in my life? Do I really want a better relationship with them? If you do, I'm going to say, and I think the Bible will bear this out this morning, the way to fix this, the way to grow in this, you have to learn to forgive and forgiveness can often be the most difficult thing in a relationship. To learn how to forgive. And some of you I know immediately when I say that, you're like, Amen. That's what we need to do. I know that's what I need to do. And others are like, Never. I, you don't know so and so. They're never going to be forgiven. Because I know if I do, they're just going to hurt me again. And we'll get to that, hopefully, a little bit better answer for you at the end of that. So hang on to that thought. And then there's a bunch of us Christians that are like, Amen. The secret is inside of us. <laughs> That's never going to happen. They hurt me too much. They did too much to me. It's not going to happen. So this morning, uh, we're going to talk about forgiveness. And this is going to need some Holy Spirit power. So let's pray. Uh, Father, we come before you and we just ask that you would begin to just soften our hearts, really, just to open our hearts to your forgiveness, first of all. We'd understand how much you did and how far you went so that we could be forgiven as you hung on the cross to die for our sins. As we open our hearts to that, we pray that you would open our hearts to your word, that it would penetrate our lives, the Holy Spirit would just come in and do some miracles in our hearts and lives as we think about some of these relationships that we're really struggling in. We pray that you would just do your work in Jesus' name. Amen. So we believe strongly that God has all the answers. I have very few for you. So grab a Bible. Find one around you. Uh, we're going to turn to our same passage. You don't know how hard I work 
to think of a different way to start this message today without reading the same scripture we read the last four weeks as a church family. But I think it's just still the best passage for us this morning. So we're going to go again to Ephesians chapter 5, verses 22 through 33. And uh, this is a passage on marriage. And as we've said all along, that these principles that we're applying to marriage can be applied in relationships. It can be applied to relationships with kids. So this is not just about marriage. But in this passage on marriage, we see God's heart for relationships in many different ways. So Ephesians chapter 5, verses 22 through 33, it begins like this. It says, Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself his Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wife as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it. Just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I'm saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. In this passage, it describes these roles of, of two people uh, in mutual submission to one, one another, helping each other with their needs. And so we, we see the husband's role to completely give himself to the needs of his wife, to his family, to serve her in a way that would grow her up in Christ. And we see the wife saying, yes, I want to submit to that. I want to submit to that authority of Christ in my life. And, and it's just a beautiful thing when it's worked. So it's, it's not this thing of uh, it's my way or the highway. Uh, this is basically kind of going out of our own way to serve the other person. And so it's this beautiful picture of love that God has given to us. And uh, that's why we say marriage is a picture of God's love for His people. And we see here, it's just beautifully described that just like the husband loves the wife, it's like the way Christ loves the church and gave Himself for her, the church. And so as Christ has done that for us, husbands, that's our job to do for our wives, for our families, to, to give all that we have. And so marriage becomes this picture of God's love for His people. But what happens is, we turn the picture of love that God has created for this, and we turn it into a scoreboard. And there's mine against yours. And how many points do I have on my scoreboard, and how many points do you have on yours? And as these little resentments and, and bitterness things grow in our lives, we become more concerned about the scoreboard. Who's winning in the relationship? Are my needs being met? Or is God's glory being revealed in our relationship? And so it can fall apart. And, and so you say, well, then how do we fix this? How do we really do something different uh, so that we don't get caught up in that scoreboard and all this resentment towards one another and this bitterness that can grow? Well, like all things, we look to Jesus. How did Jesus do it? Um, and I think what we see is that he used forgiveness. A uh, quick scripture, I'll put it up on the screen. Ephesians 4.32 says, Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. Jesus went to the cross to, to prove that he was giving himself, that he was going to forgive us. And so in that same way, in marriage, forgiveness becomes a huge tool, a huge way of life that will help us find the beauty of God's love. Probably why Jesus taught us to pray and included in that prayer, the Lord's Prayer, of forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Like he knew forgiveness was going to be an issue in relationships, that we have to constantly be thinking about uh, God, uh, just forgive me for what's going on in this relationship. Forgive so-and-so for what's happened. And just constantly working on forgiveness. It's, it's just a huge part of it. But you may say, well, what is forgiveness then? How do we really define it? Because 
all my experience with forgiveness is when I forgive people, they just hurt me. And, 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 I, and I try to forgive people, but then I find out that I really have it, and it's still growing inside of me. I think there's this great picture of it in Matthew, and we won't turn to it now, but I just want to give you a little story. And it's a story that Jesus told, and he said, it's like, uh, forgiveness is like this, it's like a master who is going to settle his accounts with his people, and one guy just owed him millions and millions of dollars, it was a payment that he could never pay. So his debt was so huge, it was impossible for him to pay. The master calls him in and says, look, you got to pay, you can't pay, you're going to jail. And throw your whole family in jail. He looks like, please, and he says, no, have mercy on me. I will repay it. This is true, he can't. He doesn't have a long enough life to repay it. What happens to the master? It's mercy on him. He says, you know what? I'm going to forgive you. I'm going to cancel your debt. And we forgive him. And that guy goes away, and he finds another guy that owes him a money, some of the money that is payable, and he says, you know what? You owe me some money. I'm going to throw you in jail until you pay it. All of the servants of the master find out. They go tell the master what his master said. He's with his servant. How dare you not forgive your friend when I forgave you everything? And Jesus' stories are always like these aha moments where it's like, oh, I get it. So like God forgave us all of this, so we need to forgive others. It's like a huge, obvious point in the story. How can we say, I won't forgive you, but then we'll say to God, please forgive me? It just doesn't add up. And it's pretty obvious. And so, as we put all these things together, my favorite definition of forgiveness actually comes from James McDonald. And if you want to get uh, we did like three messages on it a couple years ago, and you could really learn some more about forgiveness. Uh, but here's the definition on your outline: it says forgiveness is the decision to release a person from the debt that resulted when they injured you. So lots of things involved here. First of all, it's a decision. It doesn't happen automatically. You have to make a choice. You decide. Make a choice. You decide to forgive this person. And how do you do that? You release them from what they owe you. They hurt you. They owe you something. They injured you. They said something about you. They should, they should make it right. They should do all these different things. And your choice is to release them from that debt. That result is when they injured you. That's hard, isn't it? It's like we want some kind of payment. And that's why this resentment grows. It's just like, you know, they did that to me. They need to pay for that. So let me help them pay for that. I'm going to make them pay. But that illustration of that parable starts coming in our minds like, wait a minute. Jesus forgave me everything. I need to forgive. I need to forgive. I need to make this decision to release the person from, the, from all these debts and all these issues that they have against me. Or they're supposed to hurt me with. And so you say, well, what, what does that look like? Like, how practically can we really dig into this and, and find a way to, to live like that? I think it's interesting in our passage here on marriage that a chapter before, Paul has talked about a lot of these issues of forgiveness. And so if you'll turn back a couple pages in Ephesians to Ephesians chapter 4, we're going to start in verse 25. There's a little section here where he talks about how do you work through these relational issues and, and how do you treat one another now that you're following Christ, now that you're wanting to live in that forgiveness that He's brought to you. And so we're going to look at some, uh, just some real practical things here. Uh, let's read this passage here. Uh, let's actually just start with verse 25. He says, Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor. So we are members of one another. He's saying we're all connected here. There's something really important. Uh, you need to speak the truth. So on your outline, instead of criticism, we can speak the truth, but the catch is in love. We speak the truth to make them pay. But what does God want us to do? He wants us to speak the truth in love. Uh, Ephesians 4.15, just a little bit earlier than that, says, Speak the truth in love. This is how we grow up into Christ. This is how we become like Jesus, is by speaking the truth in love. 
So forgiveness does not mean we just let everybody do really knowing whatever they want to do, however they want to act, and we never hold anybody accountable, and then we just have to forgive everybody. We're like a giant doormat. And God calls us to speak the truth, and God speaks the truth to us. So we can begin to replace criticism by speaking the truth. How do you do that? Uh, in a worldly sense, this is one of the formulas that, that uh, has been suggested. So instead of accusations all the time, uh, it's kind of a formula like this. When you did such and such, then I, you take ownership for it, I felt, and what I would like is something different. So when you left all the dishes out on the counter, I felt like, how rude that I would have to clean those up in the morning because I didn't want to clean those up. I wanted to wake up in the morning and start my day. And so I would love it. It would be helpful to me if you would help me start my day by cleaning the dishes at night and not leaving them out. Okay, that's good. You can still use that in a way to punish people, though, can't you? You can still make people pay. You can put all kinds of niceties with it. Uh, for me, as I was kind of meditating on it, I think maybe our formula with Christ should be more like, when you, I felt what God wants. Can you get down to the bare minimum of what God wants in this situation? Because you might find out that God doesn't care about the dishes as much. But maybe the attitude behind it. So maybe there is an issue that you need to speak truth to to help somebody become more like Christ. But is your attitude trying to help them be more like Christ? Or is your attitude to make them pay for what they did to you? Big difference, isn't it? And really hard to do. But instead of criticism, we've got to learn this whole area of speaking the truth, but in love. And just a great scripture verse that's been ringing through my ears for about the last three weeks. First Peter 4 8. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. Aren't there a bunch of things that we get upset at that really have no business being upset at? They're just stupid little things. But maybe there's an issue where we just need to say, you know what? I'm going to give that up. It's not that important. I can love you in spite of that. So keep that in mind as you think about not criticizing, but speaking the truth in love. Look at verses 26 and 27. He says, uh, be angry and do not sin. That's really hard. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity for the devil. He goes on to list a bunch of other stuff that you're not supposed to do, and here's some ways you don't want to talk. And then he gets down to the very end, and what does he wrap it up with? Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another. So don't be angry, or be angry and don't sin. Don't let the sun go down on your anger, but forgive one another. You get the sense here? Instead of being defensive, God wants us to deal with things, doesn't He? Instead of just holding them in and letting them build up, He wants us to deal with them. And I think a great word for that is to confess. Sometimes confess how you've been hurt. Sometimes, and most of the time, confess how you have sinned, how you've fallen short. So instead of being defensive, what if we were able to confess our own sin? Quick question. When do we confess? When does God want this process to happen? Before the sun goes down. So I don't know if it's like strict on that, but the idea is as soon as possible. Don't let these things grow and just continue to build because then it turns into bitterness and resentment and it will destroy your relationship. So instead of being defensive, we just need to learn how to confess our sins. James 5.16, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. So if you can begin to pray for that person, your resentment will melt away. Sometimes it's really hard to do that. But if you can pray with a good heart for the people that you're having issues with, sometimes your resentment will just melt away and you'll find out God is going to help you confess some things. Let's look at verses 28 and 32. He gives us this whole list. Uh, of, of just kind of a process here of things that we need to think about. So I'll just give you the outline point and then we'll talk about it. Instead of contempt, because that's that next step, blessing, encouragement, doing what's right in a situation. 
Let's look at those verses. Verse 28. He says, let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor doing honest work with his own hands so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. If you're doing something wrong, change it. Then he talks about our words. Verse 29, let no corrupting talk come out of your mouth, but only such as is good for building up. Some of our conversations got a lot shorter, didn't they? <laughs> a lot of the things that we say are not about building up. They're about tearing down. But for building up as fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit. Get that like God gets sad when this is the way we act. He says, don't grieve the Holy Spirit of God because you've been sealed by Him for the day of redemption. And then here, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tender hearted. It's a whole different picture here. Instead of contempt, it's this picture of blessing. And I'm gonna I'm gonna do what I can to encourage you in these situations versus make you pay for all the things that upset me. That will revolutionize our relationship if we can get that one under our belt. Let's look at the Big idea now. Second half of verse 32 again. Uh, so, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. Remember that last step of those four horsemen was stonewalling, building walls? How do we break that wall? We forgive. We just have to forgive. So, instead of building walls, learn to forgive. This is where we follow the example of Jesus. Uh, this is the gospel that Jesus would break down that wall and forgive us so that we could be with him, to have a relationship with him. It's a beautiful picture. Now, as we hear all of this, some of us still have that nagging question just like resounding in our heads. It's like, yes, but, yes, but if I do, they will hurt me again. They're going to go down that same road. I know they are. How do I, how do I work with that? I want to give you three things that uh, really help me put this in perspective. This isn't going to answer all your questions. I'm just going to say from the outset, if you're struggling with that question, you need some help. You need to get some other brothers and sisters around you that can really walk through that and help you. We can't answer that in, in a couple of minutes here. But three things that will really help you understand forgiveness better. First of all, forgiveness, forgiveness has to do with the past. When we're forgiving somebody, we're not thinking about the future and what's going to happen. We're not even thinking about what's happening right now. We're thinking about something that happened in the past. When you hurt me, now I'm choosing to release you from that debt. That occurred when you injured me. That happens in the past. That means that forgiveness can be done by all of us at any time, and there's no restrictions. So we have to begin to separate this issue of forgiveness and the possibility of them hurting me in the future. So that's step one. Forgiveness has to do with the past. Now, there's another part of this. Reconciliation has to do with the present. How many people does it take to reconcile a relationship? Two, right? How many does it take for forgiveness? One. You can forgive and put it under the blood of Jesus Christ all by yourself, regardless of their attitude. And you'll find healing there. But reconciliation has to do with the present. And if you want to look up Matthew 18, it just gives you a great little... Uh, it's a biblical way to work reconciliation in your heart and life with others that you're having issues with. And again, that's an issue where often we need help. Romans 12, 18 just has this great little line where it says, If possible, live at peace with all men. So I recognize there's going to be times where two people aren't going to reconcile because they're not willing. They're not able. Or maybe it's not safe for one person. But you still need to work through reconciliation or through forgiveness. And reconciliation is a possibility. Now, here's the biggie. Trust has to do with the future. Not the past. Not the relationship as it is. But when I'm worried about trust, I'm worried about what's going to happen next. What's going to happen in the future. 
how do I how do I set myself up in a way that I don't keep getting hurt in the same way? Well, often as a believer, there may be a way that God wants you to work through that, and you are going to get hurt for the sake of the gospel. In other situations, there's things that are diametrically opposed to the gospel. If you're in an abusive relationship where somebody's hurting you and damaging you physically, mentally, emotionally, you can forgive somebody and call the cops on them. Right? You can send them to jail and forgive them. And some of you have had to do that. With kids, with issues that have been in your life, but you still have to work through the forgiveness issue. Reconciliation may not be possible. How do you trust them with the future? Do you have to trust them with the future? Who are you supposed to trust? I was thinking about, isn't that weird? Like, the Bible never tells us to trust one another in a, in a real bold way, does it? It tells us to trust two. I wonder why that is. Because God's the only one that's not going to fail, right? That doesn't mean we rely on each other, we have faith in each other, it's important to have trusting relationships and all of that. But the focus of the only one that cannot ever hurt us would be God. He's going to be faithful. So trust has to do with the future, and hopefully those things will help you out a little bit. So I don't know where you're at today. Uh, maybe you're really stuck on this whole criticism thing, and you just realize, you know what? I just, I just rant about the stupidest things, and I really just need to kind of close my mouth sometimes and do some forgiveness, let love cover a multitude of sins, and it's not that big of an issue. Or maybe I need to speak the truth in this issue, because I just can't get over it. And, and I need to figure out how to do that. Maybe it's uh, defensiveness, and every time somebody says something, it's just, it brings up these walls, and it can't be me, and, it's, and you just throw things back at them. Or contempt. Maybe you've gone to that level where you're just, you're really lashing out at some people. And, and that whole passage there describes that clamor and bitterness and anger and all these things that are happening to make noise to the fact that so-and-so is hurting. Maybe you're stuck there. And maybe, and in fact, all of us have some of these walls that are up. We just said, you know what? I'm not talking to you. I'm not going there. And my suggestion to you is that you need help with other brothers and sisters that can help you walk through that issue. It's not a simple issue. Matthew 18 is a challenging process, and we have to do it together with a lot of compassion and a lot of leadership. As the worship team comes today, let me just pray for us that we would Maybe begin to internalize some of this forgiveness that Christ has for us. Father, we pray that as you have shown us so much on the cross, how far you would go to forgive us. The depth, the length of your love is just so beyond what we seem able to do. But we pray as we begin to uh, turn our hearts towards you, as we turn our hearts towards what you have done for us, that it would just grow this affection for you in such great ways that we'd say, God, you've done so much for me. I've got to be able to forgive this person. I've got to be able to repair this relationship. I've got to be able to speak the truth in love. So, Father, work those things in our hearts. Help us to ask for the help when we need the help. And I pray if there's anyone here today that's never experienced that forgiveness, that you will just penetrate their hearts even in these moments as we sing about your amazing grace, how it touches us, how it breaks free, all those walls that we've been building and we can just trust you for our lives. We pray that you'd work in our hearts now in Jesus' name. Amen.